with the with the, with the brumination. And my admin will be here with my little connector. Which I forgot. The elevators, the elevator went out. Just totally broke everything. I'm losing my mind. So I'm not really losing my mind, but I'll say that a lot. This last year, my course evaluations, people were concerned for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, but don't worry. Um, so the problem with doing transition states with the brumination is that we're going to, in terms of our mechanism, we're going to have the first step is going to be the arrow going to the bromine, and then the bromine bromine bond breaking going to the other bromine. And that then forms our, our bromonium ion with the two positive charges. The problem is that partial bond is going to get totally messed up with the partial bonds of the transition states. So any reaction involving bromine, I'm not going to ask to write the transition states for. So you would just have that, and then your bromine, your bromine minus coming in, and it'll add to either carbon, it doesn't matter. And then the arrow will go to the bromine either shifting up or shifting down. And then we would end up with, as long as the bromines are on opposites, opposite wedges, then they're OK. So it doesn't matter which carbon the bromine, if the completely negative bromine attacks? No, we can add top or bottom. And what's important is it adds somewhere. And then you get the two different bromines. Okay. All right, thanks. I have multiple. Well, see, that's because I put it back here. All right, thanks. Thank you. So that's, it doesn't matter whether that's top or bottom. So the most important thing for the rumination is. Yes. Now, that's not true for the bromine and water. Because the bromine and water, depending on the alkene that you have, the bromine and the water, it's important to which carbon the water adds to, particularly if it's an unsymmetrical double bond. So what I mean by that is that if If I had this plus Br2 and H2O, again, no transition states for this. But the mechanism would look like this, where the bromine, where that would be my first step in terms of the double bond reacting with the bromine. Then I would make my bromonium ion Now with my methyl group in place, now when the water adds, which carbon does the water have to add to? The most substituted one, which in this case is going to be top or bottom. Top. So then the water has to add to the top carbon. And then the, then the pair of electrons goes to the bromine that then goes to the bottom carbon. So that it doesn't, and it doesn't matter here whether I added the water 
above or below the plane of the ring. What's critical then is that the methyl group gets the opposite wedge and that the bromine gets the opposite wedge. So if you added the water from underneath, the methyl and the bromine have to be bold. If your water is on a bold wedge, those two groups have to be dashed. And then in the final step, you would lose the H plus with the arrow going towards the oxygen. And that would then have the OH on, on the dashed wedge and the bromine on the bold wedge. And again, the critical part here is that the bromine and the OH are on opposite wedges. I would have, um, yeah, the H, this H plus would combine with the, this becomes a BR minus. So then that H plus and that BR minus would, would couple together to form HBR. If you show that, that's fine. If you don't show it, I'm really looking at these species as being the important ones. Exactly, because the transition states are going to get messed up with the dotted line to the bromine. So for anything with bromine, no transition states. Everything else that has an H plus with it, yes, I would want the transition states. Um, just a little question. So up on the top right, you were the, that little arrow going to the BR from the dash to the BR. That indicates that it's just shifting. Right. That means that the bromine is going from being in the triangle like this to then shifting down. Just like over there, it if I added from the bottom, it would shift up. And then when we do the, the H going to the O from the water molecule, is it the double bond going to the O or is it the H, like where that arrow starts? That arrow, that arrow, yeah, that's people mistake this a lot. That little arrow right here is the movement of electrons. So that's the OH bond breaking and the pair of electrons going back to the oxygen to give it to lone pairs. So it's not coming from the H. It's not coming from the H, it's coming from the it's coming from the bond. So what are the arrows that we need to include so we don't lose points? Like how last time we had the one arrow? All the ones I just wrote. So the you just go through it so make sure. Um Everywhere there's an arrow. Arrow, 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 arrow. Just those are the arrows that you need. Sorry. Um, how about chargers? Is only charge you have up there or is only carbocation? Uh, I do have these partial charges on the bromine okay. and the bromonium ion, which are important. So again, those those would be the charges that I would want to see, the delta plus charges here, as well as the plus charge on the oxygen. Okay. Um, so is it, in the so why does the water add to that top carbon uh, as I know for so too, but um, so I, I know the sentence like a, the one with more is going to get the group, the one with more hydrogen. Right, but and so if you go back to when we were when we were talking about this before Thanksgiving, um, the idea was that when you're when you have a bromonium ion with different alkyl groups on the two carbons, those pl delta plus charges are not equal. So if you're the water molecule sitting here as a weak nucleophile, you have to add to the carbon that has the greatest delta positive charge. And the carbon with the greatest delta positive charge is the one that's most substituted. 
that's why the water adds to the carbon with the with the most substitution. And if you go back and you look at the notes for that day, you'll see that if you just treat the BR as if it was an H plus and add it to the right carbon, you end up with a tertiary carbocation. Or up here, if I added the bromine to the bottom carbon, I'd end up with a tertiary carbocation. If I added the bromine to the top carbon, I would end up with a secondary carbocation. So the tertiary carbocation is where the water is going to add. Um, but because when we do this reaction, the OH and the BR end up trans 100%, that means that it's not just the bromine attached to that carbon all by itself. The bridge, the fact that it's 100% trans tells us it's bridged. And so the bromine's blocking the front, the top side attack. So only the water can only add from underneath. So what have, what would you do if there wasn't a, if there wasn't a methyl group? Because then it would be even the then it wouldn't. So it would be a symmetric. So it wouldn't matter whether you added the water to the top or the bottom. It would be like that one over there. The one on the board and it would just be the water could either add from the top or the bottom but when it's unequally substituted it's got to add to the the most substituted carbon the water has to add to the most substituted carbon and since this has a carbon cation it is not um stereoselective but it no it doesn't have a carbon cation nope this is an oxonium ion this, this is a triangular intermediate. And whenever you have a triangular intermediate, it's 100% trans. Okay, so it can be regioselective or stereoselective. Like this one is actually, right, right, this one is actually both. This is both regioselective and stereoselective. Right, the one that has the methyl group here, this reaction would be both both regio and stereo selected. Um, I was looking at the packet and I was confused about how to answer number twenty and twenty one. That's because we haven't done that yet. Oh, okay. So you don't need to know it? No. So, well, we've not done any free radical halogenation yet. Um, and free radical, so, so free radical halogenation is when you take an alkane. So it's an alkane plus Cl2 or Br2 with either light or heat. So wherever you see those reactions, we're going to do those next semester. In this book, they don't do free radical halogenation until second semester, whereas in the other book, it does. It's done first semester. So we haven't done we haven't done that. The other reactions we have not done. Are merc anything with mercury and anything with a three membered ring with an oxygen in it. So these are reactions that we haven't covered yet. So when you see those on the old exams, we haven't talked about those yet. There's also like um, IUPAC names on there. Should we go over that again? No. Okay. Now the IUPAC, so in the old book, they didn't throw up, throw the naming at you all at once. They took it chapter by chapter. So hopefully you haven't forgotten your IUPAC naming, because the final is coming. But, um, yeah, easy. I'm hoping at this point you can do easy. But am I going to explicitly ask you about easy? Probably not. 
So on some of these like practice ones, you have Fisher projections and Mills projections. Will we have to like in interpret those and transfer them to our molecule, or you're just going to give us the molecule straight up? So the molecules that have that are either in Fisher or um, Sawhorse projections. Well, there's. Uh, I don't think I gave you a Fisher projection. Um, okay. So it would be in a sawhorse. A sawhorse. Okay. So if, so for instance, if your molecule is in a sawhorse projection, So let's say let's say I gave you this molecule and I said write the major product of this reaction if I do it if I react this with NH2 minus. Okay. So the first the first question is NH2 minus means what kind of mechanism? E2. So that automatically means that I'm going to do an E2. So next steps if I've got an E2 reaction. First step. Identify the the alpha the alpha and beta carbons. First step is alpha is to identify the alpha and the beta carbons. So in this case there's two. Okay. Second step. Which of those hydrogens can become antiperiplanar to the chlorine? Well, in an acyclic system like this, they all could. In a ring, only the hydrogens that are trans to the leaving group can be removed. Right. So in an acyclic system, look at all the beta hydrogens could be removed in a cyclic system only the trans beta hydrogens to the leaving group can be removed right then in the third step now we talk about NH2 minus is going to give well of those hydrogens that can be removed, the NH2 minus is going to give the most stable or substituted alkene. Tertiary is going to go after the hydrogen that is least sterically hindered. So, but the critical part is that step two is which hydrogens can be removed. Because in a cyclic system, if you only have one hydrogen, that's trans to the leaving group, it's going to give the same product whether it's NH2 minus or tertiary So don't get ahead in terms of the steps. So in this case, all the hydrogens can be removed. These three hydrogens could be removed because there's three hydrogens, and I could orient any of those three trans or anti periplanar to the leaving group. For me to remove for me to remove this hydrogen, I'm going to need to make it anti-periplanar to the leaving group. And so in this case, you're going to have, this is the case where I would give you a sawhorse, and you would have to make that beta hydrogen now anti to the leaving group. And if my choice is NH2 minus as the base, it's this hydrogen that I'm going to want to remove because that's going to form the most substituted double bond. So we have to, so basically for the right hand carbon, there's nothing I need to do. For the left hand carbon, I now have to put the hydrogen down here. So in order for me to move the hydrogen from being 
towards you to being in the plane, I'm going to have to rotate it back. And when I do that, I'm going to rotate that hydrogen back. That's going to put it in the plane. The group that was in the plane is going to now come forwards towards you. And then the methyl group, this is the weirdest one. The methyl group is behind, but it's down. So if I give it that little, that little rotation, it's still going to be behind, but now it's up. The most important thing is it's still behind. So it still gets a dashed wedge. So now when I put that hydrogen antiperiplanar, now the NH2 minus comes in, grabs the hydrogen, this pair of electrons moves, the chlorine leaves, and now when I'm writing the final product, the groups that are bold are cis, and the groups that are dashed are cis. So that means that the methyls, in this case, would be cis, and the ethyl would be cis to the hydrogen, not the other double bond. So that's where the sawhorse comes into play, is on these kinds of problems. To clarify, like as long as you have the L and H on the same side, it could be on top or on bottom. That isn't what matters, right? Right. What what matters is is that this carbon has an ethyl and a methyl. This carbon has a hydrogen and a methyl, and that the ethyl and the hydrogen are cis. So if you wanted to take this molecule and you want to rotate it up, so the so is ethyl, hydrogen, methyl, methyl, that's okay. But don't swap the groups across carbons. That's bad. On this one too, so the dashed CH3 on the right side, that has those three hydrogens that also could be removed? Right, but in this case, because we're using NH2 minus, mm -hmm. we're going to form the double bond that's most substituted. If I change this reaction and said, um, if I change this reaction and said, let's do it with tertiary then those CH3s would be removed. So, So if I let's see if this will work. I know easy for me, not so easy for you. So now if I said I'm gonna go ahead and react that with tertiary it would no longer be the left beta hydrogen, it would be one of the CH3s that would now be removed. Because these hydrogens are primary and this hydrogen over here is a tertiary hydrogen. So if it was tertiary then if we make this a CH2 with an H on it, it would come in the arrows would look like that, so that nothing would happen to the left side. Okay. 
the left carbon, the left chiral carbon would would remain the same. All that would happen is I would have a double bond to a CH2. So that would be the major product with tertiary toxide. Right, the tertiary since both hydrogens can be removed, the tertiary toxide will go after the hydrogen that's least sterically hindered. For the tertiary toxide product, does it matter if the, uh, the double bond in CH2 is... It could be on. down here, it could be up there, it doesn't matter. There's, there's free rotation around that bond. So the double bond could be down or it could be up. So that's where the this is this is where the sawhorse comes into play, is with doing E2 with acyclic systems. Cyclic systems are easier because it's just a question of cis or trans. This one you've got to manipulate the molecule to put the hydrogens in to put the hydrogen per, anti periplanar to the leaving group. Okay, so tertiary toxide is going to remove the hydrogen that's least sterically hindered. This, these beta hydrogens are primary. These, this beta hydrogen over here is tertiary. So by definition, primaries are going to be less sterically hindered than tertiary. They will also, it'll also produce a double bond that's less substituted which is why NH2- minus goes after the other carbon, goes after the other beta hydrogen. NH2 can get to either one. Right. So NH2 is small, it can get to either, either of those two, and so in that case, it's going to produce the more stable product. But with tertiary toxide, it's it can only get to the hydrogen that is least sterically hindered. So in other words, you have to determine the mech you have to determine the mechanism. Uh, here's one that I just kind of came up with this morning, which which I'll oh that's gonna change okay take away the methyl group. So here was here was one. So I so first I said let's react this with water. Then I said let's react it with hydroxide. Then I said let's react it with NH2 minus, and then let's react it with tertiary toxide minus. So one molecule, four problems. And what I also, what I also, my commentary on this was that these are the kinds of problems that were in the packets, both the, in, the packet we started in class as well as there was another set of homework, another set of practice problems where I, where they were multiple choice, right? So I gave you, you know, six products and said A only, B only, A and B only. I am not repeat not going to do that you'll have to write the products 
And for those of you that are somewhat bummed out about that, let's look at the statistics. So if there's multiple products and you get one of them, then you get partial credit. If it is multiple choice where you have to identify the correct answer and only the correct answer, you get zero points. So if you're kind of bummed out about the multiple choice, it'll work in your favor to be able to write the products. In my opinion, you know, when you're answering multiple choice questions, that's kind of what well should be doing is kind of writing down the product and seeing what's there. But we can have that conversation before the final. So for this one, here's a here's here's a set of problems. So the first question you need to answer for this is what's the mechanism? So what's the mechanism for water? SN1 and E1. Is everybody clear on how that how we got that? So does E1 always go with SN1? Yes. So SN1 and E1, because remember the first step of the mechanism is, in both cases, is to break the carbon-chlorine bond, or you know, carbon-halogen bond, and make the carbocation, because that's the first step in each, they're locked together. Anytime you get SN1, I'm also going to ask for the major E1 product. Despite the book saying things to the contrary, SN2 and E2 are different. And the reason we're making them different is because I've identified only two things that will do E2. Kirschbutoxide and NH2 minus. And they've decided to dip their toes into the gray world of things that are strong nucleophiles and strong bases, and I don't want to go there yet, although I kind of have. But E2 will only happen with terpsbutoxide and NH2-. And there will never be one where it's SN2 and E2? Right. SN2 and E2 are totally different in our world right now. You don't. I'm asking you to write the mechanism for SN1, and I'd ask you to write the mechanism for the major E1 product. So, like, on all these questions on top, I would ask, like, if SN1, if SN1 or E1 produce the major product, that won't be on the exam? No. No, because it's. It's more complicated than, than they're even making it. So, uh, last one. OH minus. SN2. I'm, I'm lost. Where did SN1E1 come from? It's a weak nuclear file. H2O is a weak nucleophile reacting with what kind of halide? Secondary. So secondary plus weak nucleophile, SN1, and now E1. 